It's a good one. We'll give it about two seconds. Yeah. And we are live. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian, and I am thrilled to have with me today Hill Harper, who plays uh, Dr. Uh, Marcus Andrews. I almost called you Marcus Welby. We were talking about <laughs> Marcus Welby, so Marcus check that show out. I'm old. Yeah, Marcus Welby, MD. So Marcus Welby on uh, The Good Doctor. Marcus Andrews. On the uh, or Marcus Andrews. I'll get this right. It's, it's early. Marcus Andrews on The Good Doctor has a, a Juris Doctorate degree from Harvard Law School, and most importantly, is a huge advocate for financial inclusion, financial health and well-being, and is Experience Boost Ambassador, and is the author of The Wealth Cure, Putting Money in Its Place. So thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. And good morning to the West Coast. Good afternoon. Good lunch break to the East Coast. Um, excited to be on. Excited to chat with folks. I think there's so many things we have to share and that you can bring to the table to help people understand why personal finance is so important. Before we start in that, into that discussion though, I'd like to know more about you. Your, our journey started in a similar place. You're from Iowa originally. I'm from Kansas. Oh, really? you went to, yeah, I'm from Kansas. You went to Harvard. I went to the Harvard on the Plains. Which University of Kansas, and that's where our paths diverged rapidly. <laughs> but we started Bill Country. Isn't the University of Kansas in in Manhattan, Kansas? No, it's in Lawrence. Oh, so that's Lawrence, Kansas State Lawrence. University is in Manhattan. Kansas State, okay, sorry, yeah. I got to yeah, got yeah. So, so, because I lived in Manhattan. Oh yeah. New York. And New so, York. So, but you know, I live in Brooklyn now, but I used to live in Manhattan, and so, you know, maybe that's it's, a, it's another similarity, but I guess it's not because. Kansas State and Manhattan, so that, that yeah, so, Hey, we try, right? <laughs> but we still have similar passions, and I think that's what's important. But before yes. we get to, tell me more about that journey, because I think that's fascinating. How do you go from Iowa to Harvard University to being a thespian and uh, a, a television actor, and where in that journey did you develop this passion for personal finance? Well, well, you know, first of all, I was very, I was very blessed because um, my family, um, my mother is from a small town in South Carolina called Seneca, South Carolina. And my father's from a small town in Iowa called Fort Madison, Iowa. And both of my grandparents, on my mother's side, my grandfather's named Harold Hill. And he had a pharmacy called Piedmont Pharmacy that served the African-American community during Jim Crow segregation when black folks couldn't go to Walgreens or Rexall or any of those places. They went to Piedmont Pharmacy in, in Seneca and, and he showed me and represented what community service was about. He, I, I remember being a little, little boy sitting in his pharmacy and he would trade prescription medicine for someone who didn't have any money for a sack of potatoes. Maybe they were a farmer, but that's all they had were potatoes or, or they had chickens. You know, it was the type of thing saying he always tell me, you know, people still need if people still need what you have, then give it to them and they'll find a way to pay you back or you'll get paid back some other kind of way. And that and then on my father's side, my grandfather there, he had a farm, 88 acre farm outside of Fort Madison that had, um, you know, goats and chickens and cows on it. And um, and then he also was a doctor and he, he, he used OBGYN family practice. And he delivered babies. And. And so again, that was about service and community service. And so both of my parents ended up being physicians as well. Um, my mother became an anesthesiologist. My father became a psychiatrist. And we, you know, I was born in Iowa City, Iowa, when they were doing their medical residency at the University of Iowa. And, you know, uh, we moved around a lot, ended up going to high school in Sacramento, California, went back east to go to undergrad at Brown University, went straight up 95 to Boston, uh, to go to Harvard and did a joint degree at Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School of Government. And all that time, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about education is that I hope that hopefully it expands your opportunities, not limits them. And I think we say the wrong thing to a lot of pe young people, particularly we tell, we want them to know what they want to do and then study that. And that's not true. Just study things so you can be a more learned person. Because people ask me, well, you have this, you have two graduates from Harvard and one's a law degree, but you do a job that you don't even need a high school diploma to do, you know, actor. And, and that's absolutely right. The idea is that if the more education you have, the more choices you should have. So you can choose to do the law if you want. You can choose to do uh, uh, acting or something like that. Whatever you want to do, 
let it expand your choice rubric. And, and that's what it was. And so as I was writing my books to answer your question about wealth and financial literacy, as I was writing my books and I developed a foundation called the Manifest Your Destiny Foundation, working with young people and working with their families, particularly from the most uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods and backgrounds, what I started to, to realize is that many of the reasons they would tell me they couldn't do this, because I was all, always about what are your dreams? How can we, I always say you're an active architect of your own life. You can build whatever life you want, no matter who you are. But just like an architect approaches building a structure, we need to create a blueprint. We need to create a blueprint for your life. So many people walk around without a real blueprint. They say they have it up here, but they really don't. They haven't really mapped it out. And so I encourage the people I work with in my foundation to map it out. What I started to find, it added to my blueprint. They started telling me that one of the biggest impediments they had was money and access to money and debt and all the debt elements that kept them tied down. And so I came up with a quote that a lot of people pull from my book where I say, you can't be free if the cost of being you is too high. You can't be free if the cost of being you. And for so many people, it's expensive to be poor, you know, and that's the sad reality of it. And and your credit score is a big piece of that. You know, when, when we have this latest data point that came out talking about um, if you have a subprime score below, you're going to pay over the course of your lifetime over $200,000 in added interest fees. How can you ever dig yourself up out of poverty? How can you ever dig yourself out out of a negative financial situation if you're already 200,000 behind and you don't have the best economic opportunities? And so I really wanted to dig deeper into finance, financial literacy, wealth building, um, to try to, to solve some problems that I was noticing working with folks through my foundation. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's something we see and I hear the same thing from people. It's you're starting at a deficit when your credit history isn't working for you. And that's where, you know, and we talk about experience boost and, and how that can help people get that leg up a bit and try to give them an advantage. So really interesting. My grandfather, so our grandparents apparently played a big role in our lives too. And my grandfather used to say similar, almost what you said, he said, you won't know what you want to do until you're doing it. And mm. his point was try things, learn, be engaged because You'll find what you want to do, but yes. you have to, if you just get on a path and don't have an open mind and yes. be interested in learning, you won't try new things. And, 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 and to that point, it's oftentimes difficult to try new things if you're not in a position or able yep. to, or if you feel locked or, or locked down or, you know, chained to a job, chained to a, to a credit card debt, chained to your bills. All these things can stop and limit your ability to move freely. And, and I, so I think that, 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 that your grandfather was right on point with that. Yep. It, absolutely. I mean, I, and I love that, you know, being an architect of your life because it's so important to, to know who you are, where you want to go. You mentioned uh, in the wealth cure, you talk about your relationship with money and at um, a night at the Henry. And I thought that was really fascinating. Can you share a bit of that experience? And do you think, and I've kind of had this kind of thought too. Do you think that people need a money moment like that to help focus their their energies on money or help them start to learn about money? Well, the story you're talking about is, is uh, pre-social media, pre-Instagram yeah. story. And so I don't think folks need that moment anymore. Um, what he's referring to is, is a, you know, a, a friend of mine spending an exorbitant amount of money, you know, buying bottles, being out, doing things where you could realize that you could almost send somebody to college on what this person was spending and, and realizing that how someone uses money, you could actually transform someone's life. But oftentimes we, we overspend on things trying to impress people that we don't even like, you know, and it, why? What, what, how, how can we be much more strategic? about how we use money and also encourage our circle to use it strategically and focus, et cetera. But the point is that was pre Instagram. I mean, you can just, you know, go on Instagram right now and see folks who are presenting a life or a lifestyle that's really not even true, right? It's like, you know, showing all the best pictures at the best places and like, oh, my life is incredible. Uh, you know, and so it's not about that. It's about 
happiness. It's about true happiness. What makes you happy? I talk about this idea of being unreasonably happy. What is your source of happiness? And certainly it's not money. And certainly it's not showing somebody that you're cooler or happier or richer or whatever, driving this car or that car. It's, it's about finding your passion, finding what makes your heart beat faster, being connected to people, loving folks and all of that. And I call that living a wealthy life, right? Now money plays a piece in that, like living, being truly wealthy. We have all these wealth factors. The number one wealth factor for me is my health. I believe that's number one, because I truly believe if you don't have your health, it doesn't matter how much money you have. You know, there's that wonderful, but sad quote from Steve Jobs, where he said he would trade the iPhone, every, every Apple, every, the, the whole company, Pixar, and every billion dollars to see his daughter graduate high school. He didn't get there, right? And so here's the deal. No matter how much money you have, no matter what you've done, you know, I, I'm a cancer survivor, right? 2010, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Your, my health is, is, I put that at the top of my wealth factors. And then there are other things. My family, my son is, at the, you know, right at the top of my wealth factor, right? It, you know, those are the things. And so and then money is just a, is a, a foundational element to help me build the life I want to build in my relationship to money. And so having um, noticed and seen things where, where there are egregious uses of money or interesting uses of money or really seeing inspirational uses and effective uses like like Muhammad Yunus and his micro lending program and, and, and realizing that you could transform communities with micro loans, right? Mm -hmm. It's not even about the big dollars all the time. It's about really smart dollars. And, and that's why I came up with this idea of smart money versus dumb money. And I talk mm -hmm. about that a lot. Yeah. So do that. Tell us a little bit about what's smart money, what's dumb money. You know, it's, it's very easy when it comes to the individual to identify smart money versus dumb money, right? Most of us have been taught that as a, a dollar is a dollar, like every dollar is the same, but it's not true. There are smart dollars and that, those are dollars that are working for you to build the life you want. And there are dumb dollars and those are actually dollars that are actually working actively against you from building the life you want. And I believe if you could ultra over index in smart dollars and smart and usage of smart dollars, because remember money is just a tool. So I talk about money from the use standpoint. Money is simply a tool, just like credit, your credit score, simply a tool. You are not your credit score. You are not your bank account. You're not the money you have. These are just tools. It's just like you're not a hammer, right? A hammer is really good. And this is, this is how you identify the difference. I, I love to use the hammer example. Hammer is really good tool to do what it's purpose to do, which is pound a nail. So if you have to pound a nail, it's much better than using the palm of your hand, which will get torn up and all of that, right? So pounding a nail is really efficient. But what if you have to clean hardwood floors and you use the exact same tool as a hammer, you're actually going to do more damage than good. It would have been better if you just left the hammer alone. Money and credit and credit cards are the exact same way. So smart money, how you spent money that day, by the time your head hits the pillow and you wake up the next morning, is it worth an equal or potentially greater value? In other words, it's earning interest or it's you, you spent it on something that was beneficial to you, like healthy food, for instance, you're actually better off because you ate that delicious kale, organic kale salad, and you spent the money on organic kale salad rather than the, uh, the fried buffalo wings, right? That, that's smart money. Dumb money is the exact opposite. When your head hits the pillow, by the time you work up, wake up in the morning, is whatever you spent it on worth significantly less or costing you more? In other words, high interest credit card debt, or you spent it on a depreciating asset that depreciates rapidly. And you, and you actually, you, you bought it with a credit card, so it's costing you more and it depreciates, like an expensive car, expensive sneakers, stuff like that, right? Depreciating. So smart money versus dumb money. Um, and then you, looking how you spend. And if you over-index on smart money spend, investing, investing in yourself, um, you know, setting up, and I, we can talk about different investments and different things that I like and, and recommend. So if you in, in, do, use that versus dumb money spend, and, 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 and I'm different than like Su Susie Orman and Dave Ramsey from the standpoint that I don't make you feel guilty about the money. I just want you to identify it, right? If you're going to spend what I call dumb money, then understand how and in what way you do. Because for instance, a guy came up to me, I was wearing some Nikes. He said, Hill, 
you're wearing Nike shoes. You told me that that was dumb money. And I said, but you have to understand, how did I buy them? How? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I own Nike stock and I only buy the amount of Nike shoes every year that I get paid in dividend from Nike stock. So therefore, um, Nike is actually paying for these sneakers, not me. And if Nike has a down year and I don't get any Nike dividends, then guess what? I'm wearing my year old Nikes because I'm not buying any new Nikes this year. But Nike has an up year. They pay a dividend. I get money. I can use that dividend to then buy sneakers. So therefore, I'm investing in the company that I'm actually supporting by buying their shoes and I'm letting their dividend pay for the shoes that I buy. That's smart money, in my opinion. And you still have nice shoes. Yep. <laughs> True. I mean, and that's, you know, we, we run into the stuff issue too. It's, and, you know, I would say that, that credit's a financial tool, exactly what you said. Debt's a financial problem. Debt can be a financial tool if you use it as businesses do. If they're investing their cash and their capital, yes. you get a return and they're using the bank's money and paying at a lower interest rate than they're getting in a return. They're using debt to make money. Yeah. That can make sense. But if you're just using a credit card to buy stuff, and at the end of the month, you can't remember what you bought with that credit card, which happens to all of us at some point. It's stuff. It's dumb money. You're, it's that same issue. It's just wasted it. I don't know what I'm doing with it. So it's about being purposeful with the way you use credit, purposeful yeah. with the way you use, so use your money. To the blueprint of being an architect of your life. Yep, exactly right. Create a blueprint, then you know what's important to you. And then every choice in your choice matrix can be run through the filter of that blueprint. And if, and if that choice doesn't fit the blueprint, then you make a different choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and your now your tool analogy is right on the money too. Speaking of money, it, it's, it's about being purposeful. You know what you're going to do with that tool and how to use it. Right. I think that's, that's so important. So that's a fantastic point. Um, in, um, putting money in place. You dedicate a whole three pages to credit reports and credit scores. Yeah. And I think that's exactly right. I mean, and I tell people, you don't need to know a whole lot. There's not a lot you have to cover. You don't need a novel length um, book. You need to know fundamental things and you cover those things really well. Um, and we talk about, you know, since the book was published, there is the one new development, uh, Experian Boost. And can you talk about, you know, so that's really changed that, that landscape. Yes. Talk about why you have become an Experian Boost ambassador, why that's so important to you and why do you think that's so what valuable? I, what I really like about Experian Boost and the reason why um, I'm an ambassador and, and promoting it is because for so many folks, they have thin credit files. They may have um, limited credit history, reportable history, and, they, and folks have never had the ability to have any control or say to input positive data about their bill paying. And oftentimes the algorithms, because folks have to remember, since you are not your credit score, and remember there's no person like a live person sitting behind a, a, you know, the, the curtain giving, you know, doling out credit scores. This is an algorithm, right? It's, it's, it's done through an algorithm. And therefore, since there's up until now, there's been no ability by the individual to say, hey, you know, I've actually been paying these bills because what, you're, what your algorithm is attempting to, 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 to rate is whether um, my, my credit worthiness, the idea, do I pay my bills and, 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 and have I, do I have a credit history of paying bills when they come due? And oftentimes, if you have a thin file or you, you have a limited credit history, you don't have that. And so Experian Boost allows the individual to load in positive payment history through, you know, cell phone bills, uh, electricity bills, and, you know, any type of utility payment that's done automatically through their personal bank account. And so what happens is, is that you start to build a thicker file and thicker payment history, and that can have a positive impact on your credit score. And that's a positive thing. And so anything that pushes in my mind, anything that starts to push and evolve the algorithm of actually being able to evaluate the person more accurately and have more information about the individual and, and, and allow a credit score to be created through that um, is important. Because you have to understand that people from different backgrounds prioritize 
different types of bill pay. For instance, many of the folks that I work with through my foundation, they'll absolutely always pay their mobile bill. Why? Because a mobile bill is their lifeline. They communicate with their family. It's how they keep up on information and all of that. Sometimes they'll allow their credit card to stay maxed out. Oh, you know, and, and if you're making a choice, they'll roll their credit card over. Now, obviously that's not great for their credit score, but at the same time, the, if the algorithm doesn't recognize that they paid their mobile bill that same month, it, it, that, that can't, they don't get any positive benefit from having paid that bill vis-a-vis -vis their credit score. And obviously your credit score ultimately impacts the interest rates you pay and how much it costs you over the course of your life. So Experian Boost can improve your credit score and, and, and it's your FICO 8 score specifically. And I like that. And hopefully, I'm hoping that this, this, this new, the, the advent of Experian Boost is going to push the other credit rating bureaus to evolve as well. And, and, and it'll encourage even experience to continue to evolve the algorithm so that people are really rated um, in, a, in a more uh, accurate way about who they are and their ability to pay their bills and how they pay their bills. Yeah, and I think that's, to me, that's been really incredibly exciting is it, uh, and I've been with Experian more than 20 years now, and it's the first time that we've given consumers that kind of control. Yeah. So people now control what's going in it. They have a choice. And I'm always being asked by people. That's the point that you just made. You can opt in or opt out. That's what I like yeah. about it. It's not that yeah. once, you, once you're in, if you don't believe that your score is moving the way you want it to move, then just opt out. And it doesn't hurt you. There's, there, in, the, in other words, there's no downside to opting in, checking it out, seeing it, what happens. It happens in real time. And then over time, it'll continue to work. Hopefully, you know, it'll continue to work for you. Now, if you don't like it, opt out. And so that's another thing that I like about it. It's not like, you know, it's going to continue to, to grab information from your, from your records if you decide, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I'm, I'm a proponent of it, and, and, and I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, and that's so true. I mean, it's, we've never, as an industry, been able to tell somebody, tell us what you want in, because we think this will help you. And it really, it's, what makes me proud is of uh, being part of Experian is that we're looking for innovative ways to help people, which is something you may not have heard before, you know, to think that, it's, that the credit bureaus and Experian wants to help people gain access to credit and we're finding ways to give them control over that. That's an amazing thing to me. Yeah, and, you know, so I, it turns that model around. It wants to be accurate. I mean, ultimately, yeah. I think Experian, any of the, you'd hope that any of the credit rating bureaus, uh, including Experian, want to give the, the most possible accurate That's score true. in information to a lender as possible. That's, yep. and so if you don't know, this person has been paying every month their utility bills, their cable bills, their, you know, all these bills, electricity, all of these bills, then how can that, you know, how can that necessarily be an accurate representation of them? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's, you know, it's about, and that's what we are about is helping people connect with business. We don't want that to be a barrier. Businesses want customers and we want to help people make that transaction. We don't want to block that. We want to make it happen. And you're exactly right. When it, I'm asked all the time, you know, I paid my cell phone bill every year, every month for 10 years. And I didn't, I thought I got credit for that. And I thought I got recognized for that. And you, and you didn't, and now you can. And because it does give us a more accurate, perception, particularly of people who have not had access to credit, uh, who have not had the ability to um, have traditional kinds of low cost credit accounts. Um, you know, you know, it, you know very well, I'm sure about the, the issues around um, financial um, deserts where there are no traditional um, kind of banking institutions where low cost credit is available to large portions of our population. And this kind of helps solve some of that, I think. Right. Um, and it helps people who just simply didn't have access before now show that they're, they're a good credit risk and can yeah. help improve their lives. I think that's a, such an incredible story for us to be able to tell and, and appreciate and thank you for helping us tell that story. Um, because I think it's, it's such a, 
a, a new kind of um, opportunity and a great one to, to, to share and, and to be able to help people. So um, it's hugely important. Um, and I just, and I had in my notes, because I keep looking at my notes, and you said right off the top, one of the things that you said is you can't be free if the cost of being you is too high. And I thought that was a, a tremendous insight because that's what we see. We talk to people with low credit scores, subprime scores, little or no credit history, and the only things they have access to are payday loans or predatory lending situations, can't have access to traditional banking, can't get money from an ATM. Rent a home. Rent a home, yeah. Almost to 300% interest, you know, in terms of the cost of prison. It's crazy. The, the, the idea of the people who can least afford it are preyed upon the most by negative financial products. And that has to change. And one the way it has to change is that if, if we can really educate folks in terms of financial literacy, then we can shut those places down just because they won't have any business. Um, and that's, you know, that's where I come in and hopefully my foundation and the work we're doing with Experian, hopefully that, that to me, this is just a gateway. Having people boost their credit is great, but it's also a gateway to having a converse, a much bigger financial literacy conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so tre tremendous. I mean, so important is, and that's kind of the, as you said, it's the foundation. You have to have knowledge first. So getting that that foundation of, of financial knowledge, and I yep. think it has to start when you're young, but then we have to reach people at the right points uh, and, and so that they're open and ready for that information uh, and, and figure yeah, out where that is. It's about habits too. Yeah. And, and the good thing about right now, we're living in a time where technology can almost create the habit for you. Meaning I, you know, for me, I set up automatic savings, you know, so I don't even see, you know, some of the money that comes in. I never even had, I don't, even if, you know, I have that moment where I need to, to buy something with some dumb money, I may not even have it available to me because it's already gone into a smart money bucket that, you know, that's already before it even hits my account. And so technology allows us to, to do a lot of that. Uh, for us, you know, and and you know, understanding what those tools are and how to to do that is an important piece of the bigger financial literacy puzzle. Yeah, yeah, and revisiting the dumb money conversation because you brought up, I think, another really good point that it, it, if you plan that spend, it might be a, a just stuff. It might be a you know, a, it would if you didn't think about it, it would be dumb money. But if you've saved that money for that particular sort of expense that it's just your thing you know it's it's free money in, in a sense uh, to use and you, you plan for that that's not the money no no, no not at all mm -hmm. i i call it save and pay cash right if you don't have to go into debt to do it you know it, that's not dumb money right that's right. It's actually smart money because you're improving the quality of your life you're, you're enjoying it take that vacation just don't just don't go into massive credit card debt for that vacation. Plan for it, save for it, do it. It's just like uh, even I, I ask this question to the students I teach. I say, "Hey, is a new laptop smart money or dumb money?" And they're like, "Oh, someone likes. Oh no, it's dumb money because it depreciates so quickly. Technology, there'll be a new version in six months. It's better and faster and cheaper." And then others are like, "No, no, no, it's smart money because I can improve. I can I can do my homework. I can do work. I can I can improve the quality of my life." I can say that. And then I say, but no, well, listen, it's, it's, it, it, it can be both. You're right, but it's really how you pay for it. If you go to a rent to own shop and pay 300% interest, or if you put it on a credit card and pay it down over five years, it costs you double. Or if you save up and pay cash, then it's smart money because you saved up, you planned for it, you paid cash and it's costing you exactly what it's costing you. And then they get surprised to learn they said, well, you know, what computer do you think I have? Oh, you have the best brand new ball. I said, no, no, no. I bought a refurbished, you know, Apple Mac, you know, the least expensive one that you refurbished. Just because I thought that was the smartest, smartest money to spend. I paid cash for it. I think it was like $500. And that's the computer I use. It's a nice, it's a nice computer. It gets the job done. And it was, a, you know, $500 uh, used computer. It had a warranty. So, you know, there's ways to think about your spend. And just because I could afford to buy the nicest uh, one, it's just like my pastor used to say, he, he looked around the parking lot, he saw all these expensive European cars. And he came and he said, listen, I need this congregation to start buying a car 
they can afford. And when I say afford, I mean afford. <laughs> Except you can't buy a Ford car anymore for much longer. So it's going to be a truck, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, or a Mustang. The F-150. F-150, awesome. I, that, that's my dream. That Raptors, that smart money or dumb money to buy that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't afford a Raptor. My truck's 10 years old. I live in Texas, so you have to have a truck in Texas. I think it's a law, but it's 10 years old. So what are you going to do? <laughs> um, and then, you know, we, we, and we kind of talked about this looking back at my notes. We, we spend a lot of time talking about money and financial inclusion from the individual perspective. Mm -hmm. But we don't always talk about it from sort of the external forces. So the question that, that I kind of have is what can business and entrepreneurs do to help address a real problem, societal barriers to financial health and financial access? Because I think that's a huge question. There are great programs. Boston Builds Credit, for example, is looking at the difference in um, the wealth of, of minority families and in, in communities versus whites in white families in Boston. And it's, it's astronomically different. It's, you know, there's, uh, you know, white families have a, a net worth on average of something like $80,000, which isn't a phenomenal number. African-American families, $8. Yeah. A lot of that's societally imposed and we have to recognize that yeah. and we have to find ways to address it. Do you have any thoughts there? I mean, that's sort of a big question for a, a few minutes, but, but I think it's an important one to, that we have to raise and address. Big question, but a re relatively simple answer. Um, I believe that because of discriminatory forces, you haven't seen true market forces, you know, apply. And what do I mean by that? There's so much beautiful investment opportunity in the most ignored communities, but because of discrimination, fear, um, basically misrepresentation, historical lies, misinformation, you don't see the investment made. And that's where the shame or the problem is. Investing in diversity, investing in diversity of people that you, that you work with, but also investing in the communities. Right? Literally finding those organizations and people that are working in these communities giving them access to capital, letting them invest to rebuild and build up these communities is some of the smartest money you can spend. And I'll give you a great example about institutional racism and systemic racism where it's, it's not applied properly. It was my first book. I went to pitch my first book to all these book companies. And many of them, my first book was called Letters to a Young Brother Manifest Your Destiny. It was motivated mm -hmm. book for teen boys and um, particularly inner city team boards, right? And so I go to pitch the book. At the time I was doing Seaside New York, which is a, at the time was the top five show in the country. 17 million people watched it every week. And almost at every meeting, these big book companies would say, Hill, you know, we want to do a book with you, but not this book. And I said, well, why not this book? Well, you're pitching us a book for a population that doesn't read. And you, we, we, are, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our shareholders. We are not a charity book company. We need to make profit. So we need to, to, to have books that sell. I said, well, what makes you think that this population wouldn't be interested in purchasing this book? Well, our data shows that they're not readers, blah, 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 blah. Really? Well, how about your data? What about your data should show that you're just not publishing books that they're interested in reading? Why are you blaming them? You, rather than actually looking in the mirror at yourself. And so when we did put the book out and it went to the top of the New York Times bestsellers list and then it won the American Library Association Award for Best Book for Young Adults and every library across the country stocked it. And it's to this day is the number one selling motivational book for teen boys in history. Incredibly profitable book. This, if, 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 if one of the companies that actually believed there was a market would have you know, said no. I mean, most of them said no. It took putting it out to show that there was a huge market because there was a huge need and a huge thirst for this motivational material. Same goes with investment in these communities. You have a number of banks that say, well, there's no money in us putting a branch in this community. So you let all these, let all these payday lenders pop up. 
because they the payday lenders know that there's money there and there's opportunity for them and they and they become predators where if you just had traditional banks actually opening up uh, uh, branches it would put the payday lenders out of business right because they you know they wouldn't they, they, you know people could have access to their money deposit for, for much less the investing and the diverse investing is there you know I wish someone would would lend me enough money to, to to create my own credit union or my own bank because I know for a fact if I opened multiple credit unions in these communities where there are payday lenders or banks where there's payday lenders and I was able to set up CD programs and savings programs and give people access to their money quickly and cheaply you know I, I know it would work but again, the flow of capital is discriminatory and, his, and, and, and too much vestiges of history have held that back. And it's, and, and it's very difficult because there are people already in these communities doing all this work, but their access to capital is much more expensive. So it makes their ability to scale much more difficult. Yeah, yeah I think that's so important. And I think you're, uh, you know, looking at some of the programs that are out there, I'm really excited about how do we change and that's sometimes the hardest thing to do. So great insight. I mean, you know, I think that's hugely important. Um, and you talked about unreasonable happiness. So this is sort of the last question on my list and you covered them right at the start. So you got ahead of me, what seems to happen, but that's great. Uh, <laughs> as you answered the question, let's talk about that again, because when I read that, you know, that actually it should be the most reasonable happiness we have, that we're, we're not struggling with debt, that we're living a life that gives us joy it doesn't mean we're living outside our means. Why do you think we feel by, like that's unreasonable in some ways? We sort of have this um, reticence, you know? You know, I, I think a lot, of us, a lot of us have subconsciously been taught that, that we have to struggle. Um, a lot of us have this subconscious that, that, that life has to be painful and relationships have to hurt and that everything if, if, if there's not problems or chaos or instability then you're not really living and I just think all of that's not true um, the things that have happened in my life actually and that's not to say they're not roadblocks and bumps and all this thing I, you know like I said I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer in 2010 it was scary my father was diagnosed with the same age as me and he's since passed on from cancer right so I certainly don't want to follow in my father's footsteps in that regard and so I'm, I'm attempting to do my best to, 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 to mitigate that. But at the same time, I'm still living my life to the best of my abilities and taking risks and having fun and, and not saying, oh, I have to live inside a bubble because I'm afraid that, you know, I'll pass away soon be like my father did because he had the same cancer I had. And so, you know, it, everyone has their own definition of what their life can be. And there's all these different factors that I believe that are important to helping you live. And the reason why we call it unreasonable happiness is because I want people around you to look at that person and say, dang, they're unreasonable. Why are they so happy? They work in the desk right next to me. Why are they so much happier than me? I mean, it doesn't make sense. And it's literally, it's unreasonable that they're so happy, right? And, and that goes back to the point. It's not about the car you have or the clothes or the watch or the this or the that that creates the happiness. It's about in here and in here and in your spirit and your soul and your psyche. And the people you surround yourself with in your circle and what you do, do you meditate? Do you do stuff for your mental health? Do you do stuff for your, your, your spiritual health? Do you do stuff for your physical health? Do you do stuff for your financial health? Do you do stuff for your friends and families and networks and give back and figure out ways of giving back? And all of those things um, are pieces and part of being unreasonably happy and, and not being fake happy not being Instagram happy, but being truly unreasonably happy in your core. And I believe happiness and love radiates out. And when you give it away, it comes back and you can share it. And it's just like, in, to me, investing in people. I invest in people all the time, right? Because I want to see people go for, it, go for it. And most of the time, let's just be perfectly honest, those investments don't pan out because most small businesses, most startups fail. That's okay. Right. I'm happy to make that investment. That's part of my plan is to say if someone comes up to me with the right plan and they're engaged and they hit me at the right moment, even if it's on the subway, you know, I mean, OK, I'll listen. What Really? OK, this sounds good. Huh? You know, I don't mind that because I have a whole set aside that's about money that I don't need to get back. Right. It's about I'm going to invest not expecting a return. And 
And that makes me unreasonably happy. And I'm not saying everybody has to do that, but that's part of my unreasonably happy uh, matrix. And um, I get excited when I see other people excited. I like to excite people, right? So it's, it's an exchange. Cool. Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's such a cool concept. I mean, and I think you're right. It's, it's in the heart and in the core and being making other people feel you're unreasonably happy. I love that perception, you know, that kind of perspective. Um, do, do we have questions? We're going to, we have a few questions. If you, um, so, and some comments at the bottom too. They're hard to follow here. I've got Mike uh, Delgado is going to help me out with this. So see if we can read them to you. Should I press the all? This one from Jill. So, okay, so I do have some questions here. So uh, for Hill, um, Jill asks, how long did it take for Hill Harper to pay off his student loans? Ooh, that's a great question, Jill. So I graduated with 100,000 100, plus in student loan debt. Ouch. And um, it took me, it took me about six, seven years. And I was so happy when I paid off that last one, you know, and, and, and it was literally really being aggressive. I was really aggressive with that pay down. Um, I was like, I'm, I'm every, you know, here's the deal. Many of us have been taught that we have to buy or have stuff. And when you come out of school, if you continue to live as lean as you did in school, you know, I remember I used to get the, that, you know, three Kraft macaroni and cheese boxes for like 59 cents from the dollar store. And, you know, you, you know I mean, it's not great nutritionally, let's be honest. But at the same time, I mean, you know, and also ramen noodles. Ramen noodles. <laughs> I had a lot of ramen. <laughs> you know, you can make ramen noodles much better by you can get the cheap marinara sauce and then you take the ramen noodles and marinara. And maybe that doesn't sound too good to you. But listen, it's possible, right? Um, the the there's there are ways to to sort of cobble together saying I'm going to dedicate this huge pile of money to paying down debt. Student loans are some of the most debilitating loans over time, um, and they can hang over our head like a cloud. I was really aggressive with mine because I just wanted to get them over and done with, um, and so it took me about seven years. Yeah, so that you did a little better than I did. I only had twenty five thousand dollars in student loan debt, but it took me. 10 years. So yeah. And a little at a time. And ultra aggressive with it. I try to be ultra aggressive and you can also do side jobs that are only about debt. That's another recommendation. Oh. If you do, for instance, let's say you can sit kids or babysit or do something like that. Let's say that's a side hustle. So you do this side hustle and that side hustle, every single penny from the side hustle goes to debt pay down. Um, that's, there's different ways of trying to structure it in different ways. I looked at it, but I looked at some of my income at the time. Um, when I came out of school, I waited tables from seven at night to 11, I mean, 11 at night to seven in the morning and, um, at a diner, a 24 hour diner. And, you know, I dedicated, sometimes it would be two days, you know, maybe Tuesday night was my student loan night. And I'd even talk to people about it at the table. And, and sometimes they felt guilty. They tipped me more. You know, tonight's my student loan. Every tip I earn tonight is going to my student loan. So, you know, just if one guy got, you know, night I left a hundred dollar bill. So, you know, you can, it works. Yeah. I mean, I often look at, you know, experience, we look at autom automotive prices and the average, average new car price that people are paying now is about 32000 dollars. $30, the average student loan debt's about $32,000. We don't seem to be complaining a lot about paying off a car in five or six or seven years, but we can't seem to manage a student loan at the same level in that same period of time. We worry about that. So, well, you know, I, the different I, issues, granted. Different mm -hmm. issues. And I also have a rule about the cars. Yeah. I, if, you can't, <laughs> if you can't pay cash for a car, remember, a car is a severely depreciating asset. So, to go into debt over a car, mm -mm, you have to pay cash. My first car was $315. Toyota green, it was rusted out on the sides, rusty bottom, um, five speed had, it was a wagon, called it the green machine. It was not a chick magnet at all. Um, and it had 295,000 miles on it, broken out seats. You, I believe you should never pay interest on a car because it's, 
it's dumb money. You're paying interest on a depreciating asset. So it's costing you more and it's depreciating at the same time. It's, it's, it's amongst the dumbest money out there. So you have to pay cash for your car. I'm sorry, you gotta buy a used car that you can afford and whatever that is, that's what you gotta do. That's just my rule for my book. I'm just saying. Yeah. And if you can afford to pay, buy that Bugatti at 1.3 million and pay cash for it, then God bless you. So in other words, I don't mind if you buy a nice car, if you can pay cash for it. No. I like Bugatti. In fact, I need, I'd like a Bugatti too. <laughs> I, I can't afford it. Oh, I don't know if I want a Bugatti. I need to insure the thing. That's the other issue. Yeah. Um, Jill has another question. Yeah. What are the, what, I love this. What are the first financial lessons Hill Harper is teaching or going to teach your son? Oh, man. I, you know, I, I really have to make him understand that, that things cost money that, that, and then, and money you have to work well, because he often asks me when I have to go to work, why I'm leaving. Right. And then I try to explain to him that I have to go earn money so we can live in our house. Um, and then the bike that he wants, I have to make him understand that I, I will go to work to earn money to pay for the bike. And so, so he starts to connect the dots between the value of time because, you know, work and me being away from him um, creates income that allows me then to spend for him to have certain things, et cetera. So is, I want him to really start to sort of make those mental connections. Um, so that's the first, that's the first lesson. Um, I'm, I've, I've already started him saving. So I bought him this little safe, uh, you know, it's like a little ATM type of bank, you know, piggy bank. So he's already saving, um, but he, he doesn't quite make the connection of value, of value of money and what something costs. So I'm, waiting a little bit on that so he understands that a bike is not the same thing as buying uh, a little doll like this it's two different things and but you know understanding cost and value yeah cool awesome awesome lesson sylvia asks my generation believed in paying yourself first from each paycheck as a form of saving money what would you suggest to current generations Oh, oh, I think that you you absolutely pay yourself first. There's a couple of different buckets. So first, the first bucket is an emergency fund. Um, you know, with the government shutdown recently, we, we really saw that people, for the most part, haven't built up adequate uh, emergency funds. So you have to have that emergency fund. I recommend at least three months of living expenses uh, put away. The more, the better. Six months would be great, uh, just in case there's some kind of catastrophe. We have to remember that one, the number one, um, bankruptcies that people file are, are medical, catastrophic medical bankruptcies, right? Because we, that injury that we have that we didn't expect to have, something happens, we're out of work, etc. So yeah. emergency fund first, and then, you, you know, and you're paying yourself into that bucket out first. And then um, you pay yourself first at least 5%. I like 10% of what you earn for sure. The more, the better. And that goes into savings or a readily uh, accessible investment. Um, and, and I'm big into auto investing into, um, into like a Vanguard 500 and Vanguard growth funds. Um, you could set those up to, to auto invest. And so that money comes right out of your bank account. You stop thinking about it. It's called dollar cost averaging. You're not thinking about whether the market is up or down that day. You just, it's just auto automatically happening. It's one, it's, it's, my father taught me that. It's one of the most beneficial things that he ever taught me. And he said, listen, allow the time value of money or compounded interest to work on your behalf. If you start when you're young doing this, you get this amazing head start. That, the vast majority of us start later. So we never get that real ramp up on the backside. And there's this wonderful story about a teacher in Detroit recently who gave $2 million upon death through her will to the Detroit um, Art Museum. And people were like, well, she was a public school teacher. How did she end up with that? She allowed compounded interest in the time value of money to work on her behalf. And it just went like this. And that's a, a huge recommendation I have. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, if, I'm finally getting, I refuse to say old, but seasoned enough that you start to see that as you save, it's flat, 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 flat. And you start to see that. Yeah. Get pretty. And it, you're reinvesting the dividends. You automatically, you hit that button to automatically reinvest the dividends. Yeah. So you never see the dividends. And 
it starts to grow and it starts to grow rapidly on the backside. Yep. Don't chase, don't chase the market. Try to, to, to anticipate it, stay in and don't look any more than you have to Absolutely. <laughs> just make it automatic. Uh, and along the market, uh, Zakaya says he's curious about investing in stock or uh, in order to boost financially, will this go that route as well? Um, I think from an investment perspective, we'd agree that you should uh, invest. So, um, so I like, again, the mutual funds element and that, you know, you can, if there's some individual stocks that you really like and you think that there's a future, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, you can go invest individually, but, uh, but I also, but I, I particularly like doing a very low cost mutual fund like Vanguard. And I've done, I'll just tell you what I've done with Vanguard. I've done, um, you know, I don't get paid by them or anything. I'm just telling you, uh, uh, Vanguard 500, which is an index fund. I do a Vanguard growth fund. These are both domestic. And then I do two international funds. There's a Vanguard International Growth, and I think that there's a there's something that's something I can't remember what it is, but there's two international. So I have two international, and I do automatic deposit into all four of those accounts, and I do an automatic deposit two times a month into all four, towards the beginning of the month, towards the end. So that means eight times a month there are withdrawals coming out of my account into those accounts, and then I reinvest the dividend. So that's that's one thing I do. That's that's me. Just telling you. The other thing I believe is, um, I do believe in whole life policies. Um, I believe that investing in a whole life policy, my policies are with Mass Mutual. I believe that investing in whole life policies are good because they're not connected to the market, but they still grow. They're, it's very conservative, old school investing. And you also can take, if, if, if something happens as the policy grows, you can take out a loan, 95% loan to value. Um, on that money with, and obviously you're not paying tax when you take that loan out or what, what have you, if you need it. And so I actually like in concert with other investments, doing a whole life policy. There are a lot of financial advisors out there that they don't like whole life because it doesn't grow as fast, et cetera, but it's an old school tortoise hair approach, mm -hmm. right? The old time tortoise, it grow, you know, 6% every year. And you also have the ability to take out a loan and it also has some death benefit elements to it for, for any of your family. Etc. Um, I'm a proponent of those as well. So those are two two direct dollar investment things that I do that I that I support. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're right. with money. It's the tortoise every time. I mean, it just there's no fast answer with money or credit. It's always about the tortoise being patient, consistent, and, and deliberate. Um, you know, if the question is, will it boost your credit scores? No, investments don't. Just so we're clear on that one, I'm not sure. I don't think that's what was being asked, but uh, it has to be a you know, your cell phone. If you're talking about screen boost, it's it's cell phone, utilities, natural gas, electricity, so on. That's reported to your credit report. So paying those bills on time, being consistent. Um, and Lucelle had a similar question. I think we've caught what future funds are good to invest in. We can advise any specific ones, but you touched on a couple of uh, well-known ones. Yep. Um, and then Sunshine asked a question. We, we only have about five minutes left. I don't think we'll be able to, to get there um, because I think it's a, a huge discussion that I would love to be part of. And I think we need to have much bigger discussion. But, um, but how do we get around these types of problems? Some of systemic racism or fear and discrimination in underserved communities. Um, you know, I think they're, they're, that's a hard, that's a big discussion. It's a big discussion, but simply put, at least the work I'm attempting to do, I'm attempting to empower the communities from within. Because ultimately, if we can prove, just like I proved, for instance, with my book, Letters to Young Brother, if we can prove that there are that, that there's great opportunity yeah. in the communities, then we'll see other we'll see investment flow come in um, to them. You know, there's a lot of enterprise zones out there where it can make money sense from a tax perspective to invest. Um, Anybody who wants to join me in what I'm doing and invest alongside with me in these communities, I'm doing a lot of investment in Detroit. I'm doing a lot of investment uh, in Newark um, and in other cities. And so, um, you know, these these are places where I'm looking to invest um, and build from within and show that there is opportunity and show that that that, that it can be. I, I call it triple wins, triple net wins, a win, win, win. It's a win for the investor. It's a win for the community. And it's a win for the people there, right? The people, because ultimately this is all about people. This is all about helping people. It's all about making people's lives better. Um, and there's a way for that. And that's why 
um, you know, that's why I like to work within communities. And that's why, it, you know, I don't think there's, it's not mutually exclusive to do grassroots, grassroots work in the community, boots on the ground, and then work with a multi-billion dollar company like Experian. We all have this, hopefully we can align our goals and we can, and we can actually create opportunity and prosperity so that more people are winning. More people have the tools to win. More people have the credit rating to actually get access to cheaper and cheaper money or less expensive money to them to build the life they want. Those things are, are foundational, fundamental things that I think folks at Experian are on board with, or they wouldn't have come to me and said, hey, let's work on some stuff together. And it's, and it's folks things that people from the community are on board with as well. And, it, and it's like, if I can be that conduit to bring big business as well as grassroots together, then, then so be it. That's great. I'd love to do that. Fantastic. Bill, thank you so much for all of the great insight. Thank you for being a Boost Ambassador. Uh, we're right at time. And thank you for taking time to be with us this morning. This is a great uh, everybody session. I hope, hopefully uh, we can do it again. And, um, and, and I just, I'm very proud to work with Experian. I'm proud of the company. I'm proud of what you all are doing and what you represent. And so thank you for, 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 for asking me to be an ambassador. I'm proud to be an ambassador. Great. Thank you so much. And mutual admiration club. Thank you for all the great work you do and, and the great insight. And thank you for being on Facebook live with us today. Everybody check out Experian boost, experian.com slash boost. And thanks for all the great questions. And we'll see you all again. I hope very soon. Take care. Thank you.